Okay. Uh, well, thanks everybody for, for making it out. Uh, today we've got Alex Rysonowski from Iowa State University, and he will be talking to us about the edit distance function of random graphs. Go ahead and take us away, Alex. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation to your virtual seminar. Um, uh, today I'll be talking about the uh, edit distance function and related to uh, random graphs. This is ongoing and kind of dissertation work. So the motivating question we have is, uh, given a fixed graph f, how hard is it to remove all induced copies of f from a graph of density p? Um, the cases that we'll take at first are f being a complete graph on three vertices, also a cycle graph on three vertices. And the next graph we'll consider is uh, k22, also known as c4. And um, the main problem is to consider what happens when f is a random graph. And uh, I also claim that this problem is, is connected to other sort of famous uh, extremal questions, one, one being the Turan. The Turan number of a graph, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that come up in this case. So what do we mean by hard work? Um, in, for this problem, we're going to measure it in terms of what's known as the edit distance. So given two graphs on the same vertex set, we're going to record their edit distance as uh, the cardinality of the symmetric difference of their edge set normalized by the number of possible edges. <clears throat> In, in this case, we can kind of intuitively think of an edit as a unit of work. So how much work does it take to transform this graph into this graph if the rule is that you have to add and delete edges um, with weight one over n choose two on, on uh, each of those operations. So let's see what edges they don't have in common. So here are the edges in the first graph that do not lie in the second graph. So we have to add those, or we have to delete those. And here are the edges that are in uh, the second graph that are not in the first graph. So blue edges we have to add, red edges we have to delete. And uh, if my arithmetic's right, we've deleted four, added six. So that should be 10. And the right number to normalize by is 36. So their edit distance between these two graphs at least as far as labeled graphs goes, is uh, 0.27 repeating. Are there any questions up to this point? OK. So let's, let's make our first attempt. Um, how hard is it to remove a K3 from a graph? So one natural thing you could do to remove K3s from a graph is to make the graph bipartite. That would be you would delete some number of edges in order to make a new graph, we could call it G prime, uh, where G prime is bipartite. If, if you do this efficiently, um, then in general, the best you could do is by deleting about half of the edges. So if, if your graph had density P, then you have to have deleted something like p over 2 uh, proportion of the edges in the worst case. That worst case would be attained by several things, a uh, complete graph with a bunch of isolated vertices. Uh, that could also be attained by a random graph of density p. And we could ask, like, in what sense is this tight? Um, if, for example, p equals 1, what are we asking? Well, we're taking some graph. We're taking a complete graph. Oops. And we want to know how many edges we need to delete from it to make it uh, to make it triangle free. And this is, in some sense, the same as saying how far is the graph from being triangle free. So you could think of the graph k n my k n minus the edges in the deleted graph. Uh, is triangle free. And we could call this graph maybe G prime. 
and how many edges could G prime possibly have? Well, this is, this is Turan's theorem, that uh, the number of edges in G prime is at most floor and squared over four. And so at the very least for P equals one, this should be tight. And there are arguments to make uh, to ensure that this is tight for uh, other values of P. And I'm going to graph what we've shown so far. So on the y-axis, we'll say distance. And on the x-axis, we'll say density. And what we've sort of argued here is that our, our function should take on the value, this being one, that a complete graph takes about half of its edges to be deleted. And so this should be one over two, uh, one, one over two. And at any other value of P, we've argued that the best you could do is P over two. Okay, so that, that's sort of a functional way of displaying what information we've uh, communicated so far. Are there questions about this? By the way, feel free to turn your mic on and interrupt me. There, it's, there's always a chance I miss um, chats in the comment. I really don't mind interruptions for these kinds of talks. It's, it's very easy to go fast when you don't want to. OK, um, yes, and I've already, I've already explained this point. Turan theorem says that we're tight at that value. Um, and we've already graphed uh, what, the, what this looks like for different values of p. Let's let's try a harder example because this one um, this one you could do in a first course in graph theory. Let's try something a little harder. So let's suppose that G is a graph of density p, and ask how hard is it to remove uh, cycles of length four from z from G. Every time I say remove a graph, this necessarily has to be induced. So I'm always removing an induced graph. Um, this, this question translated immediately into the following. What if we want, we're, we can uh, instead ask, what is the distance of your given graph G to the set of all graphs without induced C4? That's just a direct translation. And this maximum being taken over all n vertex graphs of density P in both cases. Um, and we can tighten this notation a little more describing the graphs that have no induced C4 as just four of C4. Some of you in the room may notice that this is an example of a hereditary graph property. Um, and we'll talk more about that on future slides. So how can we remove all C4s efficiently, but also indirectly? Does that, okay, this is where I will pause and ask questions. So does anyone have a really basic way to remove C4? And to do this, we're using additions and deletions of edges. I think we have a mic on for something else. Delete all the edges, you can add all the edges. Okay, delete all the edges, add all the edges. This is, this is a softball. So the two constructions we're gonna consider first is remove all the edges from G and add all the non-edges. So given that the graph has density P, we know already about how many edits we've made. In the first case, we've taken out all the edges. So the distance to this constructed graph is uh, P, because we're always normalizing by entries two. And in the other case, our constructed graph is the complete graph. And since we're adding all the missing edges, well, we're just adding in one minus P proportion of the uh, edges in the complete graph. And we wanna know how optimal this is. One thing I will say before we move on is that if you use these two constructions, again, distance being on the Y axis, 
density on the x-axis. Then our distance to C4 that we've measured is at most this red line and at most this blue line. Where at the middle we have one half. And so when we ask, is this efficient? What we're essentially asking is, is there another way, is there another algorithm we could have used to do this in general where the curve is below the curve that we have at any point? Okay, that's what I've already said, that the distance is at most this minimum of these two functions. And it turns out, yes, there are, there are ways to do this in a more efficient manner. Um, so consider the following sort of structure. On the left over here, we have something that looks like a complete graph, something that looks like an independent set. And in between, I put gray. Gray here means it could be anything. So what I claim is that if your new graph G prime can be split in a fashion that is an independent or a clique on one side, an independent set on the other with anything in between, then I claim that that new graph has no C4. So why would this be true? Well, this is true since where would you put a C4 if you could embed it in here? So C4 has four vertices. Its clique number is two. Its independence number is two. So you would have to put two of its, uh, one of its cliques here and one of its independent sets here, but that's impossible just by, just by inspection. You know, this is a clique and this is an independent set. Cliques of size two and independent sets of size two intersect uh, non-trivially in this case, so this kind of embedding is impossible. So if the graph that you produce G prime looks like this in some sense, then it naturally has no C4. So our new editing procedure is just going to mimic, um, is just going to make a graph G prime that looks as much like our original graph as possible, um, but where uh, the new graph has this decomposition. What we'll do is we'll randomly map about X1 proportion of the vertices to the black region, map the remaining vertices to the white ring region, and we'll do this IID for every single vertex. We're going to make no distinction about the structure of our graph G. Um, and this is sort of the reason why we're, we're almost entirely forgetting the structure of G and just remembering its density. Because when we do this, okay, again, I should say that um, the vertices that we map into the black set, we're going to complete that graph, that induced subgraph. And uh, on the vertices that map into the white set, uh, we will empty that graph. And then that means that the new graph we cre created does in fact resemble this structure. So now we have to ask, how many edits did we make? Well, the only edits we made involved edges where the two vertices fell into this pile and edges or non, oops, edges that fell into this pile and non edges that fell into this pile. So those would be the two uh, edits that we made. And that would just be represented by this kind of quadratic form uh, that the expected number of edits that we made under this random mapping is about one minus P X one squared plus P X two squared. And it's pretty easy to see how to minimize this. Um, you just set X one and X two to be uh, one minus P and P. And so you get it in expectation, something like P times one minus P. And if you compare the function, if you compare the two functions that we have, yeah. So overall, the distance that we have here from G to the forb of C4 is at most this function. So we went from something like, I think I did red first. And we did much better. This has a peak of one half, 
with height a quarter. So again, with distance on the y-axis, density on the x-axis, this construction uh, is a sizable improvement, especially when uh, p is equal to a half. Sometimes the structure can be quite complicated. So this, you could kind of look at it and say it looks like uh, a ball of rubber bands. Um, but it's actually a, uh, a template that's made from a, a strongly regular graph. It has the name Q44 in some, in some contexts. Um, and this was actually entirely necessary for understanding uh, distance to form of K24. Complete uh, bipartite graphs have a lot, are, end up being quite complicated for this problem. So let's take what we have so far and move it into a little more general setting and try to make things a little more formal as well. So uh, a hereditary property of graphs is a family closed under relabeling vertices as well as deleting vertices. So far, we've only considered uh, hereditary properties generated by forbidding some small graph. And let's think about why that's actually a hereditary property. So if you take a, a graph that forbids some induced f and you delete a vertex, well, clearly it still forbids f. And likewise, if you relabel the graph that forbids f, then you haven't done anything to the structure of the graph, and so it should also forbid f. And in fact, any hereditary property can be written as forb of a family of graphs, which is to say uh, any graph that forbids all elements of the set f. Why do we study hereditary properties? Some would say that most interesting graph properties are hereditary. And that would be a bit bold for me, a grad student, to say. So I will quote someone else. This is from uh, Balog Bolobash and Weinreich's paper on um, uh, basically uh, quantifying a little bit more of uh, Schreierman and Zito's argument about the speed of hereditary properties. Um, they go into a little more structural detail in this paper. And let's also do proof by authority. Noga Elon and his student Yuri Stav also said that most interesting graph properties are hereditary. So we have, we have, we have authority figures who are making this argument. And um, maybe we should also try to believe it in our own right. You've seen lots of hereditary properties. So in an intro graph theory course, you would probably see all of these properties. Being bipartite is hereditary. Interval graphs, chordal graphs, planar graphs are all hereditary. Not all of them are interesting for this problem. Planar graphs are sparse, so you don't really have to think about removing uh, how, how to edit in order to make a graph planar. You just delete all of the edges except a few. <clears throat> There's also money in hereditary properties. Uh, the Fulkerson Prize plus a one uh, $10,000 bounty was awarded to um, these four authors for their 178 page proof, which characterizes uh, perfect graphs. And there's a whole program of studying uh, similar kinds of characterizations of graphs, such as graphs that embed on certain surfaces. Does anyone have any questions up to this point? I've been kind of speeding through. Take a step. I like to think of this problem involving metric spaces. I suppose these lines could be a little bolder here. Um, so if we take all the graphs on four vertices, those are the same. If we take all graphs on four vertices, and we circle those up to isomorphism. In this case, it's just circling them up to edge count. We get a, a smaller metric space. And the edit distance between different graphs is really just um, the number of edits 
needed, the number of edges needed to take to get between the graphs. If you reduce it to up to, up to isomorphism. More interesting picture would be all the graphs on four vertices already reduced up to isomorphism. And we have to remember what is our problem. So we're considering the distance from a hereditary property. In this case, we're, we've circled all of the bipartite graphs. And we want to know what is the graph that is furthest from this of given densities. If we just wanted to know the one that's furthest, we would look no further than over here on the left. A complete graph is the furthest from being bipartite, at least of density one. Maybe this is the graph that's furthest of density uh, five, six, and so on. Yeah, so that would be our optimum. And another picture that I have quite fondness for because I like graph limits is the following picture. So in blue, I'm going to draw this as Hn. By that I mean this is the each of these is a each of these pancakes is sort of a slice of all the graphs of the given order. The whole picture is, by the way, Gn, if you wanted to give a notation for it, the graphs of order n. And in some sense, what we're doing is we want to know the graph or um, the graph sort of in the middle of this, the graphs of density p that have the furthest distance to this outside disk. Um, and for sort of convexity reasons that make more sense with graph limits, this is, this is sort of the right picture for this. So what is our original problem? The motivating question originally asked by Alan and Stav was the following. Let H be hereditary. And I should mention every time I say hereditary, I mean hereditary and non-trivial in two senses. Uh, the one sense being that the hereditary property actually is infinite, that it contains graphs of every order. And the other uh, trivial case would be that the hereditary property is the set of all graphs or all but finitely many graphs. What they showed is, what they asked is as follows. What if you want to know just the graph that is furthest from that hereditary property? It's actually a small lemma to actually prove that this limit is well-defined, that it's not just a limb soup. And for each n, we are asking among the graphs of, of order n, what is the furthest? This is a more restricted version of the problem we were originally asking, but it's in fact the motivating problem. What they showed is that for each hereditary property, there's a parameter p governing the randomness of a random graph. This is the Erdős-Rényi random graph of density p star it actually attains this maximum distance EDH star. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that anytime one of these results is shown, it usually involves a couple applications of the regularity lemma. Um, but there are also fairly slick proofs of, of these results using graph limits. And some of those are due to Boloba, uh, Lovasa and Segedi. The next sort of step that gets us back to our original general question is, given that you have a hereditary property, pick any value of p between 0 and 1 and define EDHP as the limit of the maximum distance from the hereditary property that you could get if you're looking only among graphs that have density p. And you could, you could put some sort of epsilon error term in here, and it would give you the same quantity. Um, we just chose to round to floor of p and choose two. But you could, you could round within a small window of that, too, and still be considered density p. So what Balog and Martin showed is that for all values of p, this uh, amount, this maximum, is in fact attained by a random graph of density p, which is a bit strange. Uh, because recall that we're going to be studying 
sort of a stochastic version of the question, which was edit distance from form of a random graph. And these theorems are all saying that the furthest graph from forbidding a random graph is another random graph, which is um, a little annoying to have to come to terms with philosophically. Uh, the other main tool that Balog and Martin found was that this function, if you take as your argument P on the set zero one to zero one uh, is continuous and concave down. So why is that useful for Alon and Stav's question? Well, what it means is that if you were to graph an edit distance function, it looks like this. Maybe not starting and ending at one, but concave down functions, graphically speaking, have a fairly easy to identify maximum. There are cases where it's flat. Um, so it could have multiple maxima. But um, that's the whole benefit of noting this convexity or this concavity. So our question is, what are the maximum edit distance, the value p star, and the edit distance function in general if h is defined as forbidding a random graph? OK, so this is a good moment to pause and, and ask for any questions because there are a lot of things going on and we're going to go in a couple different directions. Okay. So the big question is how do we actually compute the edit distance function? Presumably, once we get the edit distance function, we can compute the maximum uh, value as well as the place where that maximum is attained just by looking at the graph. So what we're going to define here is a notion called a colored regularity graph. Um, we've already encountered one, in fact. We, we took a template like this. Um, in the CRG language, this is a black vertex. This is a white vertex, and this is a gray edge. And CRGs are um, a more diverse generalization of this. All vertices in a CRG are white or black. And there are no non-edges, because we're coloring a complete graph. We're decorating a complete graph. And the edges of that complete graph are decorated as either white, black, or gray. In this decoration, anytime we edit a graph to make it resemble one of these CRGs, what we're doing is completing everything that's black, emptying everything that's white, and doing nothing to things that are gray. And there's a good reason why we don't use gray vertices, more or less because of um, counting lemma if you wanted that. With these CRGs, uh, you're, paired it, you're pairing it with an optimization problem, much like the one we had before. We measure the distance from a generic graph G to a CRG like this along the path that we took when we completed and emptied accordingly. In this case, we recall that we had the formula 1 minus px1 squared plus px2 squared. And we also talked about how we maximize that. We're generally, well, you could unpack this expression as in terms of the matrix governing this quadratic form. And it's important to stress that we're optimizing over the set of x, where x is a non-negative vector summing to 1, which you could also say as a vector in the standard simplex with uh, two coordinates. But more generally, what would happen here? So if, if in fact, this edge was black, you would have a 1 minus p here. If this edge were white, you would have a p here and here as well, because it's naturally a symmetric matrix. So for every CRG, you have some sort of matrix here. Um, in 
later slides, I might call this M K of P. So let's go to this example. One thing I'll emphasize on this slide is that not all vertices of a CRG are actually useful. So by that, I mean, it might be easier to edit to just a black vertex or just a white vertex that the area in between was too annoying to deal with and that you might as well just complete your graph or empty your graph, which would be a fairly depressing case, but it does happen. So in this case, the matrix corresponding to the CRG at the value P does have a one minus P here, one minus P here because of this black vertex and a P here because of the white vertex. And again, these numbers all correspond to the amount of work that you did deleting edges and adding edges. So here the quadratic form has a different kind of optimization. Um, in this case, it's possible the optimum in, in any case is obtained by setting one of the variables equal to zero, which that tells you that this is not a good structure, that it was actually these two structures doing all of the work. So we need a notation, we need a good notion. Um, what did I do? We need a good definition to capture this. It seems to be a couple slides ahead. So we call a CRG P core if the minimum value attained by any of these different weightings, this x, is attained by some vector where all of the weights are strictly positive. And another way to say this is that it's the value you get, this kind of quantity that's governing the distance, I should say here, the quantity that's governing the, the distance from your generic graph G to your new graph G prime edited according to K, um, actually uses all of the vertices of K. Which is to say you shouldn't have used any kind of sub-CRG of K that you, strictly speaking, uh, got more, uh, had to do less work if you included an extra vertex. So why are we talking about all this technical stuff involving CRGs? We need to remember that this problem is related to hereditary properties. So in, this, in these two examples, recall that C4 doesn't embed into this CRG, which means it's a good, this is a good kind of CRG to associate to a property that forbids C4. And likewise, we had briefly discussed that K24 doesn't embed into this wild CRG. And for that reason, this is a good CRG to associate to the hereditary property that forbids K24. For this reason, we define for any hereditary property the set of all CRGs which embed only graphs that satisfy H. If we've only forbidden one graph, then KH is just all, C all CRGs that don't embed your forbidden graph. Does that make sense? By the way, how much time do I have left? About 24 minutes. Okay. Thank you. So all of the CRG business is actually useful because of this theorem, which is a kind of joint theorem of two authors. So in the same paper that Balog and Martin had their previous results, they also showed that CRGs are useful to get the edit distance function. But there could be an infinite number of CRGs, and they didn't quite get that this infimum is always attained. Marshant and Thomason did, in fact, show that for all P, this, uh, this infimum isn't, is attained. Why is it a minimum? Well, it's a minimum because we're always wanting to find the best CRG that is useful for editing a generic graph of density P. You can also note that the minimum is always attained by a P core CRG because 
well, if a CRG is associated to a hereditary property, so is any sub CRG. And well, if you had a CRG that had some vertices that weren't doing any work, you might as well just delete them. So this minimum is always attained by a P core CRG. I have to define that here, um, but we will come back to this notion. For now, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, our original problem. What are the P-Core CRGs, or just generally, what are the CRGs that don't embed our random graph? I did not define the random graph. So this is this is this can be thought of as a as a strange kind of coloring question. I'm going to go back to a little bit of basic graph coloring. So if if you take k to be the CRG with w white vertices and all other edges gray, something oops, ooh, something like this. You use that CRG with all edges gray. Now the picture goes away. Then embedding a graph into this CRG is the same thing as a W coloring of the graph. Because what are we doing? We have a, we're mapping the vertex set of your small graph F into the vertex set of some CRG K, but all of the vertices are white and there's no edges in between. And um, the gray area means that we don't have to worry about whether there are edges in between or not. And since all of these are white vertices, this is just a proper coloring of your small graph F. If you're using one fewer vertex than the chromatic number, then your small graph does not embed into that associated CRG. Moreover, we can compute the G function of this CRG. If there are, if there are um, W white vertices and no, no uh, edges other than gray edges, then your quadratic form is pretty boring. It's only considering the edge deletions that occur on your, K, your W many white vertices. And on those vertices, you're editing by deleting. So, so you have to be, um, so this is proportional to P. And that's our G function there. And similarly, you could use the, cr the chromatic number of the complement and a CRG with only black vertices and gray edges. And you get this sort of general upper bound on the edit distance function concerning one forbidden graph F. And so based on this, Martin in 2013 conjectured that if you are forbidding a random graph, then the edit distance function is no more than what you get from taking a minimum of these two chromatic bounds. So why are these the two quantities you see here? Well, because this celebrated theorem of Bolobosch says that chromatic number of a random graph with P fixed is concentrated around its mean and its mean is oops, n naught over two log one over one minus p of n naught. And again, this is the quantity that you're plugging into here. And when you work it out, you get this quantity. And similarly, you get a, another quantity over here that you would plug in for b for the co-chromatic number, just by replacing one over one minus p with one over p. Uh, should have a p naught here, I suppose. So basically, this conjecture of Martin is that you can't really improve this bound 
for a random graph. And I guess there should be a tilde here. Are there any questions about that? One thing I should also mention is what are the optimal values that you get out of this? So we have, we have a, this edit distance function graphed with density on x-axis, distance on the y-axis. And we have these two lines, red and blue. And the goal from Alan and Stav was to compute this peak point, which you could call P star EDH star, or PH star, if you wanted all that. And if you had this, if you had that this formula was asymptotically tight, then you would get these values for the, uh, for the value of P star and the value of uh, EDH star. So we have a more general setup that we could use instead. And this is a good benchmark to test whether there are ways to improve this bound. In the ordinary coloring case, we use a bunch of white vertices with gray in between, or a bunch of black vertices, also with gray in between. But there's something else we could do. We could take any CRGK and use a bunch of a multiple number of copies of it. So we, we could, for example, take a CRG like this. Oops. And clone it a bunch of times. So we would take that, make another clone over here make another clone over here and exclusively put gray in between. That would be this quantity we have called M times K. M times K. And so for any CRG, we could define that as a kind of chromatic number. So we let chi sub K of G be the minimum N such that G actually does embed into M copies of the CRGK. And Bolovash and Thomason, um, this is a special case of their theorem, but it's, it's the most useful version for what we're talking about. Bolovash and Thomason showed that, they showed that for um, fixed K, that you can compute this K chromatic number of a random graph of any density that's fixed asymptotically uh, using quantities we already know, such as GK and um, yeah, such as just GK. And you'll note that this is proportional to what it should be for the chromatic number, for the ordinary chromatic number. Um, and that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise since this is uh, an example of it. If you just plugged in K being a single white vertex, then this would work out exactly to be the quantity that it is for the chromatic number. So this is in some sense a generalization of that theorem. One important obstacle to this is uh, this only explains constructions that use multiples of some fixed CRG. And there's also a sort of pathological possibility that the CRG that you have has a tremendous number of vertices in which case it wouldn't be fixed relative to N. It could possibly grow huge. And so it would be very hard to characterize when a CRG embeds into, or whether a random graph embeds into a CRG, if that CRG, if you have no control over any of its structure or even its size. So we introduce a sort of trimming for this, we have to introduce a definition, which is reminiscent of things we've done already. If you had a CRG like this, 
and you put gray in between. then it's natural to kind of consider these two pieces as components. And so we say that the components of a CRG are the subgraphs that are held together by non-gray edges. So if you were to make black and white vertices, black and white edges as strings, then these are the pieces that would come up if you grabbed a vertex and lifted. Lemma of myself and Martin is that this is useful for finding peak or sub CRGs as long as P lies in between one third and two thirds. So what the lemma says is that if you specify a tolerance and you start with any CRG, then you could shrink to a peak or sub CRG so that two useful properties hold. One, the G function didn't change all that much, which is to say they're almost just as useful for embedding uh, a random graph in terms of that chromatic lemma. And two of the components are actually bounded order. <clears throat> that's useful because we could have possibly been dealing with a CRG with an unbounded number of components in terms of n. So overall, our argument for, for proving the result for the edit for the edit distance function associated to a random graph. First, we trim any CRG that could possibly break the bounds that we already have. Again, the bounds that we're trying to break are this. So our pathological CRG might somehow have something below the peak point. If it has something below the peak point, we're not happy. Right, so if it looks like this, then obviously our original construction, one of these two constructions was not optimal. And by concavity, it's equivalent to ask um, if, you know, if this function lies below the curve anywhere, then it also lies below the curve here. Um, that's just a sort of concavity argument. So our trimming lemma, what it does is it shrinks this DRG in to something more manageable. So now each of the components lie in a finite set. Since it's a finite set, all of them can be considered fixed in terms of our tolerance and our value of p between one third and two thirds. And we're just going to apply Bolobosch and Thomason everywhere. We're going to cut our big graph, our big forbidden graph f, into a huge number of pieces and use Bolobosch, Thomason to basically color each of those pieces using the elements of this graph of this uh, set of CRGs B in the most efficient way possible. And by that, I mean basically up to a tolerance, the chromatic number of that little piece, the, the B chromatic number of each of those pieces. And we just assemble them all together. I mean, this, is, this seems like a pretty straightforward argument once you get your hand around Bolabash's theorem. Bolabosch and Thomason's theorem. Ooh. The tricky part is actually this lemma, this piece. The trimming lemma took a lot more work than, um, than it might seem on the surface. The general algorithm for proving this trimming lemma is to take, to shift immediately to a P core sub CRG by deleting vertices of weight zero, and then delete a vertex of lowest weight repeatedly until you reach a certain threshold for the value of the uh, weight vector, the optimal weight vector, and then stop. Once you're at that point, you can argue that as far as the underlying graph is concerned, the degree is bounded. That takes an argument. But how do you show that a bounded degree graph has bounded components? Well, you would need to show that the diameter of each of those components is small. And that's what we end up doing. At this point, we do have to go back and investigate some questions about PCOR CRGs. So in Marchant and Thomason's paper, what they found is that PCOR CRGs need to have a very restricted color um, pattern. If K is PCOR, and P is between zero and a half, then no edges are black and no white vertex 
is incident to a white edge. So what that basically means is that the white vertices are isolated islands and the other interesting components have only black vertices and white and gray edges. So this CRG would have five components. Um, that's, that's under this first case. So we're, we're kind of assuming that, that this, that P is between zero and a half. Um, and so it's possible for this thing to be P core. We're not saying it's P core for every P, it's just that this is a necessary condition. Necessarily, it would have to look like something like this. And for P between zero and a half, you just swap the colors in this sentence. So actually, it can't be P core at P equals one half because of this color restriction. Their result classifies all one half core CRGs in general, and it also classifies all two vertex CRGs on any interval. What we introduce now is a new notion of or a type of CRG that we'll call a Dalmatian CRG. Um, just recall that we have components defined in terms of non gray edges. The result states that on a certain interval, the only P core CRGs have these specific, um, have, have a very specific definition. We're calling this a Dalmatian CRG. Each of these is a Dalmatian CRG. So a Dalmatian CRG is a CRG that, for which the white edge relation is essentially transitive. So the only possible components are isolated white and black vertices and cliques of black vertices with white edges. The interval where this holds, that this is the entire classification of P-core CRGs, is the interval one minus phi inverse one half, where phi is the golden ratio. We don't really have a clear reason why the golden ratio is coming up here, other than it solves a quadratic equation. And if you were to negate, sort of take the photo negative of the same question, we're swapping black and white. And so the complement of Dalmatian CRGs are the unique P-core CRGs on the complementary interval, one half to phi inverse. One thing that this does is it enables computation of edit distance function on this interval of positive length. Previous results only had um, characterization on the interval or at the, point, at the point p equals one half. So now we can actually compute an edit distance function on a positive length interval without having to do any CRG magic and optimization. So there's a finitization conjecture, uh, I think in a 2013 paper that asks whether this is possible. And at least on this interval, it is possible. The way that the trimming lemma was actually proved was with what we'll call spectral prohibition. So we form the underlying graph of a CRG by deleting all gray edges and forgetting all of the colors. So this CRG that we've seen a lot is, should be 3K1 plus all this. Oh, that's already there. Yeah, so the underlying graph of this CRG has these five components, which are just found by forgetting the colors, except for gray. Gray is a non-edge. Non and we say that a graph is P prohibited if it cannot be an induced subgraph of any P core CRG. Well, I, I guess I should say an induced subgraph of the underlying graph of a P core CRG. In our paper, we defined this only in terms of CRGs. So we said a CRG is P prohibited if it can't appear as a sub CRG of a P core CRG. And what we showed is that if your graph G has minimum eigenvalue lambda, then then the graph G is P prohibited on the interval that this is 
defined in terms of that minimum eigenvalue lambda. And the proof of this is kind of fun. You take that optimization problem and you infer that necessarily the uh, matrix in the middle has to be positive definite because you can cheat, you can decrease by exploiting a minimum eigenvalue if it's negative or zero. So some future work. Uh, this is involved in the Iowa State discrete math RTG. So we have a class involving undergrads, no, no undergrads, graduate students, um, a postdoc, and my advisor. And one of our mini goals is to widen the classification, uh, widen the classification result. It's tight if you only use Dalmatian CRGs to classify, but we want to widen that interval a little more to see whether we could understand when um, uh, wider intervals where we know all of the PCOR CRGs. The other result would be to widen the interval for which, uh, for which the approximation, uh, the trimming, the CRG trimming lemma also holds. And I am personally interested in understanding this question of hereditary property defined by forbidding a inhomogeneous random graph. So if you've seen other random graph models, you may have, in, you may have encountered those that are associated to, to graph limits. And there's a natural way that you, you can define this using a graph limit. And I am interested in what happens to this hereditary property if you're forbidding one of those. In particular, do you still get, for some values, that the graph looks like this? And this is a sort of Wild West territory because we just barely know things about inhomogeneous random graphs. We barely know that their clique number is concentrated. For a generic inhomogeneous random graph, we don't even know where it's concentrated. And so we have no right to also know where the chromatic number is concentrated. So we have no idea what this line and this line should even look like in the inhomogeneous setting. And those are sort of precursors that are necessary to start thinking about this problem properly. So this is my last slide. So I'll just say thank you for your attention. Thank you for having me at your seminar. Thank you, Alex. If we could all get some thank yous, thank yous for Alex in the chat or turn your mic on and say thanks. That worked as well. Yeah, maybe some, some claps in the, the camera. Give us for those to flood in. Okay, and uh, oh, there you go. Like you got a little, a little uh, emoji there. Okay. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and uh, ask away. Sorry. May I know? Can, can we do anything if the if the target graph is sparse instead of instead of uh, dense? That's a great question. Um, so the question is whether we know what the edit distance function is if you forbid in a sparse random graph. Is that that's your question? Yeah. And also, also you start with also a, a sparse graph. Uh, when you say start with, uh, are you talking about? a forbidden graph or are you talking about if you want to know the distance of a sparse random graph to a hereditary property so i guess there there's a you you you, you, you have a starting family of graphs right then you want to reach uh, another another family of graphs so here i guess uh, both of the starting and and the uh, and the target family are, are both dense uh, what if uh, both are sparse uh, are there any theory on that hmm so uh, I should say the, the setting is sort of, you take any graph. Mm -hmm. So these are all the graphs of order n. So you can take some graph and then you highlight in blue a hereditary property. Mm -hmm. And so what you're proposing is that what if instead you had a, some other subset and you wanted to know the distance from, uh, I don't know, I'll call these I. 
Yeah, so, so we're talking about generically what is the furthest graph or the furthest graph of density P to H. But yeah, that's, that's a totally natural question. What about uh, what's the furthest triangle free graph to C4 free graph? That's, that's an interesting question and I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, I guess if we don't re restrict the, the starting family, then, you, then when, if we go from a dense to a sparse one, then the, the, the added function is always, is it one or something like that? Uh, if you went from a, so again, your hereditary property is forbidding a random graph? Or no? Uh, just, just like w w whatever we forbid, uh, just uh, the family we want to go into is uh, is sparse, is all sparse. Oh, you mean this family is sparse or? Yeah, yeah. after we forbid the, the, all these uh, forbidden graphs and then. Oh, oh whether, say, whether this plane, is sparse. Yeah, let's say this. No, no, I was saying like the, all, the, all the elements in, in H are, are sparse. Let's say the, 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 the set of planar graph or something like that. Yeah, 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 where H is. A, a, sparse or small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so my understanding uh, from this, I'm going to misspell this, but Shinerman. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll blur the letter, letters together so I don't make a typo. And Zito. So they have a theorem that essentially classifies the growth rate of a hereditary property into different classes. Mm -hmm. And so there's also a later result of, let's see, Balog. I think I had talked about this. Uh, Balog, Bolobosch, and Weinreich, which gives a little bit more structural information uh, in the various growth types. My understanding, I might be wrong about this, is that in the sparse setting, or when your hereditary property is small, then these graphs are either nearly empty or nearly complete. That is my understanding of that case. And I think some of it, some of this can be inferred from uh, colored regularity graphs. So in that case, yeah, your intuition is right that it would basically be either a zero or one, one that the distance would either be P or one minus P all the time um, because you would be moving to essentially a um, nearly complete or a nearly empty set. Okay, thank you. You'd have thank a different you. normalization to account for the you know, sparse case with that. Josh, it's, it's pretty hard to hear you. Oh, uh, you could have a different normalization. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's better. You could have a different normalization than the uh, juice two, or sparse case, right? Yeah, so we have distance G prime edits divided by N juice two. So you're saying like if you if it was a graph of linear density, what would, what would that look like? Yeah, so you would only be considering the edit distance function on a short snippet, where maybe uh, the density P is something like one over N. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know, I think um, all of this is in the language of dense graphs, which is why the regularity lemma in its most useful forms actually kick in, but I don't know. I think these are good questions. I'm also interested very much in this other question involving what if your forbidden graph is a sparse random graph? Because we know it's chromatic number, we know it's uh, co-chromatic number. It's just that the arguments haven't been made in this case and some of them might go wrong if you've, if you've actually had something sparse. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I actually have a quick one. The, uh, well, maybe quick. Uh, what is this finitization conjecture you mentioned? Can yeah, you that's a good, good question. Do I, do I get to make a new page? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of blank space there. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe I grab it and move it. No, I can't. Um, so the finitization question would be, um, <clears throat> it comes in a, a couple different forms. So basically the, the most general one would be if a hereditary Uh, then does there exist, that's backwards E, right? Does there exist a subset of the forbidden CRGs? And I guess I should also say, can you read this? Yes. And A is between uh, zero and a half. Does there exist an M such that um, the edit distance function is equal to the minimum overall elements of M of GKM or GKP? On the set, uh, let's say P belonging to A one minus A. So our proof works for A equal to one over golden ratio. Got it, thanks. Yeah, that's something we're working on right now. Do you have any other questions? Okay, uh, well, thanks again, Alex. Um, and yeah, I guess, Josh, is there anything that you, you wanna say about the, the YouTube channel to those of us that are here? Or... Like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, comment and subscribe. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Have <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you. I, I think this, this was not disastrous, so go ahead and upload it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks.